All right, and we are live. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us. My name is Dylan Hosier from the Israeli American Civic Action Network, or as our friends like to call us, ICANN. Uh, today, we are hosting with the, Ameri the uh, Armenian National Committee of America Western Region um, a special commemoration uh, to recognize International Holocaust Remembrance Day. With us here is Lena Hovanesian. Lena, say hello, please. It's a pleasure for me to be here, Dylan, on Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, we're here on behalf of ANCA to honor the martyrs and the survivors of the Jewish Holocaust. And we stand here as the Armenian American community in solidarity with the Jewish community of Nevada and internationally, of course. Great. Thank you, Lennox. We're, we're so honored to have you um, as, a, as a sponsor of this event. And we're also happy to have uh, Jewish Nevada and ADL Nevada with us as well, also as sponsors. Um, so the way that we'll do this program is um, we have a few messages from the Nevada congressional delegation. Um, so we'll, we'll go ahead and play those um, now. Uh, and then we're going to, um, or, or next up, uh, then we'll go to John Ralston, um, uh, editor of the Nevada Independent, uh, well known in Nevada, who will host a special segment with um, Sylvia Foti and Grant Goshen and their fight against Holocaust denial and distortion. Um, and then we'll hear from our friends from the Armenian community to talk about the connection between the Armenian genocide and the Holocaust. And then we'll wrap up with a, a short conversation about Holocaust education. So again, I thank you all for, for joining us. Uh, let's first up hear from uh, Senator Jackie Rosen. Hello, I'm Senator Jackie Rosen, and I'm honored to represent the great state of Nevada in the United States Senate. I'm also honored to serve as the third Jewish woman in the Senate and the first former synagogue president in Congress. I want to thank the Israeli American Civic Action Network and the Armenian National Committee of America for putting on this important event. And I want to thank Nevada's own John Ralston for helping to guide today's discussion on this critically important topic. Each January 27th, we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This is a moment to look back on one of the darkest chapters in our history. During the Holocaust, millions of Jewish people and others were persecuted, separated, and forced into camps. Families and communities were shattered Many despicable crimes occurred within the walls of concentration camps, places where countless horrors were inflicted. The people in those camps faced torture, starvation, disease, and ultimately extermination. During this mass atrocity, six million Jews and millions of others were violently murdered. I know this isn't an easy subject to think and talk about, but we must, because it is so essential to understand what did happen. We can never forget those who were taken from us or the suffering endured by those who survived. We must educate ourselves on the horrors inflicted, on the lives that were lost and on the lives of those who survived, and on the men and women who stood against hate, discrimination, and evil. We must learn lessons from this period of history in order to ensure that never again truly means never again for anyone. We must back up those words with concrete steps to address hate in our world. And that begins through education. No one, no one is born with hate in their hearts. That is something that is learned. But we can prevent hate if we teach about the Holocaust in our schools and give teachers the resources they need to teach it. That's why last year I introduced the Never Again Education Act, a bipartisan bill that would help fund schools and provide resources and training to teach our students the important lessons of the Holocaust. Last year, I'm proud to say my bill became law. This couldn't have happened without the support of groups including ICANN and ANCA. At a time when anti-Semitism is on the rise, we must act to prevent ourselves from going down the same slippery slope of prejudice, bigotry, hatred that led to atrocities such as the Holocaust. We must speak up to address incidences of genocide, mass violence, and human rights violations across the globe. 
Last Congress, I was proud to join my colleagues to recognize and remember the Armenian Genocide. Our resolution encourages education and public understanding of the facts, including the role of the United States in humanitarian relief efforts and the relevance of the Armenian Genocide to modern-day crimes against humanity. From these dark chapters of our past, we must band together to bring forth a brighter future. I look forward to working with all of you in our shared mission to combat hate through education. Thank you. Great. So I want to say thank you to um, Senator Rosen. Senator Rosen has been a great friend of our community and, and really um, is a leader on the issues that, that impact us. And I know, Lena, for you is the same. Um, so next up, we will hear from uh, Congresswoman Dina Titus from the 1st Congressional District of Nevada. Hello, I'm Dina Titus, your Congresswoman for Nevada's 1st District in the heart of Las Vegas. I want to thank Dylan Hosier, the Israeli American Civil Action Network, and the Armenian National Committee of America for hosting this virtual commemoration for International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Today, we remember six million Jewish lives lost and the millions of others who were systematically murdered by the Nazi regime. Saying the words never again must be more than a slogan, must be a promise to honor the dead with our words and deeds. Sadly, violent anti-Semitic incidents have surged in recent years. I know many of you watched in horror earlier this month when white supremacists, some of whom wore clothing spouting Nazi rhetoric, stormed the U.S. Capitol. We all heard the vile chants that were shouted at the deadly rally in Charlottesville, and we remember those shot and killed at the synagogue in Pittsburgh. It's just alarming that less than half of Americans know that approximately 6 million Jews were killed in the Holocaust, and millennials know even less about the Holocaust than previous generations. That's why I co-sponsored the Never Again Education Act, to expand the resources given to educators across the country to teach about the Holocaust in their classrooms. I'm also proud to co-sponsor legislation to elevate the rank of the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism through the State Department. Let us also not forget the Ottoman Empire's concerted mass murder, deportation, and exile of more than 1.5 million Armenians between 1915 and 1923. I co-sponsored the Armenian Genocide Resolution, which passed the House in October 2019, to formally recognize this tragic event and to provide relief for survivors. Furthermore, I spearheaded a letter to the Librarian of Congress to correct the outdated and inaccurate term Armenian Massacre to the subject heading of Armenian Genocide, and that has been accomplished. By expanding the study of the Holocaust and the Armenian Genocide and ensuring lessons are passed from one generation to the next, we can help combat the hate and prejudice that continue to be a dark stain on our society here at home and around the world. It's imperative that we continue to document and teach these events so that we never again let hatred, fear, and xenophobia lead to such tragedies. As a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, I'll always work to strengthen the unbreakable bond between the U.S. and Israel. And as a member of the House Democracy Partnership, I look forward to bolstering our ties with Armenia. So thank you all for honoring the lives of Holocaust and Armenian genocide victims, sharing the stories of survivors, leading by example to root out hatred in our communities. I'm inspired by your advocacy, and I'm grateful for all you're doing to make Nevada a better and more tolerant place. Great. So thank you, uh, Congresswoman Titus. And um, next up, we have a brief video from Congressman Horsford from the steps of the Capitol. Hello, I'm Congressman Stephen Horsford from Nevada's 4th Congressional District. I wish I could be with you in person, but I'm honored to join you virtually as we observe International Holocaust Remembrance Day. I'd like to thank the Israel American Civic Action Network and the Armenian National Committee of America for hosting this very important event. Today, 
we solemnly remember the millions who were murdered by the Nazis, and we recognize the millions more whose lives were forever changed by the Holocaust. After the Holocaust, the world pledged never again. But in the decades since, too many have forgotten or sought to erase the horrors per perpetrated by the Nazis. But when we forget the past, we miss the warning signs for future atrocities. So we must remember the Holocaust and the Armenian jo genocide and the Rwandan genocide and the modern day genocides of the Uyghurs and the Rohingya Muslims. When we remember, we can prevent these events from happening again. Last year, I was proud to co-sponsor House Resolution 943, the Never Again Education Act, which expands education programming on the Holocaust and reaffirms America's commitment to promoting Holocaust education. I was heartened to see that this important bill passed with a bipartisan majority in the Congress and was signed into law. H.R. 943 and state-level efforts to promote Holocaust education are important, and I'm thankful for ICANN's efforts to educate future generations of Americans about the Holocaust. So today, as we mark International Holocaust Remembrance Day, may the memories of all those we have lost be a blessing. Right. So thank you, Congressman. And I, I will say, Lena, you know, we have a we're, we're lucky in Nevada to have such a great um, congressional delegation, very strong um, on the issues that impact uh, both the Israeli and Jewish communities and also the Armenian community. Absolutely. Um, we're truly blessed. They have been extremely yeah. responsive, both the congressional and, a, and the senator delegation. And we have them in our corner. And that's that's we appreciate that type of support uh, on the Senate floor, on the congressional floor and also here at home. And, and I think thanks to that is um, thanks to uh, Shelley Berkeley, <laughs> Congresswoman. We're we're so glad to, to have you with us today. And again, I think that the the leadership that we see from the congressional delegation is is really those are people who are following in your model. So uh, so thank you for that. And uh, here I'll let you have the floor and say a few words. I right, thank you, Dylan, very much. Um, uh, Dylan did not have to email me twice to ask me to be a part of this event. I think it's very, very important, uh, not only to remember, or I should say acknowledge Holocaust Remembrance Day, but to plot a course forward of what we're going to do that is going to um, educate uh, future generations of Nevadans and Americans as to what the Holocaust was, what it meant, and how to prevent something like that from ever happening again. Um, uh, Dylan, uh, I am just delighted to be on the call with you. Uh, work together very closely on the anti-BDS legislation, which is very successful. I'm picking up some rumblings that we may have to uh, revisit that issue in this legislative session. I hope that's not the case, but I suspect we'll be working together again on that issue. Um, Andy Armenian, it's so nice to see you on this call. As you know, long before it became fashionable, I was a uh, uh, an outspoken advocate uh, against Armenian genocide and making sure that we recognize it as it should be recognized. Um, uh, 20 years ago, I was sitting in the Foreign Affairs Committee uh, at hearings, uh, um, uh, Armenian genocide, and it just uh, rocked me to my core that we weren't able to get it passed at that time. Um, and I've told this to Andy on numerous occasions. When we held the hearings in the Foreign Affairs Committee, there were three very old women uh, dressed in black in the, front, uh, in the front row of the hearing room. And they reminded me so very much of my great of Greek origin. And um, I, um, listening to uh, the other side explaining how this wasn't a genocide was truly chilling to me. And as a Jew, there was only one way for me to believe and one way, uh, one, one thing to support. And that was the support of uh, 
acknowledgement of Armenian genocide. So I hope we'll be working together in the future too. And in deference to my friend, my long, long time friend, I won't say old friend, John Ralston, I will try to be short. When I was a kid, I was a um, and I was president of Las Vegas Benebrith Girls, and we met every Wednesday night at the old temple, Beth Shalom. And occasionally we would see films of the liberation of the concentration camps. And I remember sitting there as a young teenager, 13, 14 years old, thinking to myself, how is that possible? How could this, what insanity overtook the world that uh, Jews would be in such danger that six million would have been slaughtered merely because they were Jewish? I never understood it. As I got older, I came to realize that, unfortunately, the Holocaust was not an aberration. It was a continuation of the hatred and prejudice and anti-Semitism that has existed in the world for millenniums not a millennium, millenniums. And so I came to realize as an adult, especially when I represented the United States at the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz, that we must be ever vigilant. We cannot take anything for granted. And I think the what we've, what we've observed in our own country over the last few years has been nothing short of chilling to me. But my chills don't put me down. They commit me further to ensure that this never happens again and that we can educate future generations of fellow Americans to ensure that none, nobody, nobody should be in fear of their lives or their liberties because of their race, their religion, their color or ethnicity. And that is something that I have devoted a lifetime to ensure. I know that there are a number of pieces of legislation, or I should say bills that are gonna be introduced in the legislature this session, which is gonna be very challenging because we're not gonna be able to go up and lobby, but we need to unite as a community uh, Jewish community, Armenian community, all communities that have been um, horrified by a Holocaust of their own and decimated, we need to work together to make sure that we can pass a comprehensive, intelligent bill um, to uh, promote education in, um, uh, in K through 12. It is very important that we do that. The future of our democracy depends on it. And um, I look forward to working with everyone. I know that the ADL has been very involved in this for quite a while, and I will look forward to testifying at the legislature and making sure that we get the best possible legislation to ensure that Holocaust education is taught in our schools. And with that, sorry, John, if I've gone too long. Uh, Dylan, I turn it back over to you. Thank you, Congresswoman. And, and uh, this this event, I think, is a testament to um, to uh, collaboration among the organizations that are are going to push uh, push for good, reasonable legislation here in the state of uh, in the state of Nevada. And we'll be glad to have you uh, testify. So, all right. Sorry, Lana, you're, you're muted. There you go. <laughs> oh, I said you're Shelley's muted. always been a longtime supporter of our community, and we look forward uh, to work together with the Jewish community to put to together a comprehensive education bill that will really help our youth to be informed about our history and, and look forward to brighter days ahead. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So we'll, we'll move on. Oh, hold on. Did you want to say something, Congresswoman? Yeah. I, um, I have a number of Armenian, um, American Armenian students at Toro, Nevada and Toro, California. And a couple of months ago, we did a program on the California campus via Zoom, of course, with our Armenian students and anyone else that wanted to participate with a Congresswoman Jackie Spear and uh, it, uh, who's a co-chairman of the Armenian Caucus. And it was absolutely spectacular, but I uh, recognize that I have a number of students that were very impacted by the recent problems in Armenia. And so we were there to lend support and help to them. Great, thank, thank, thank you very much. Me. That means a lot to our community, especially right now. Thank you, Shelley. 
All right. So um, forever our favorite congresswoman. <laughs> all right, congresswoman. We'll, we'll see you soon. Uh, all right. So next up, um, we have Mr. Ralston. Hello, sir. Uh, he is the editor of, of Nevada, the, the Nevada Independent. I think it's one of the best or <laughs> the best uh, publication in the state of Nevada. I'm not uh, not trying to kiss up, just telling the truth. It's a great, great paper. And um, we also have uh, Sylvia. Where are you? Forty. Here you are, uh, Sylvia Foti and Grant Goshen. And um, the, the three will discuss a, a very interesting story um, about uh, Sylvia and Grant's efforts to um, uncover the truth of Holocaust history in Lithuania um, and uh, their journey from beginning to end. So I will hand it over to you, uh, Mr. Ralston, and let you uh, speak with Grant and Sylvia. Well, thank you, Dylan, uh, and, and uh, it, it is just an honor to be here with, with Sylvia and Grant. I have to tell you that, and it's an honor to be on a program with uh, warriors for, for, for the cause like Shelley Berkeley, and, and who is an old friend of mine, and, and Jolie Breslin of, of, of the ADL. It, it really is. Uh, the program has a special resonance for me, not just because I'm a Jew, but because I'm engaged uh, to be married to a woman who is half Armenian. Uh, and so uh, it, it really, uh, it, it is something uh, for me to be here. Uh, Sylvia's book, which I've read over the last few days, uh, really uh, has an immense power and, and I cannot recommend it enough. She's probably gonna be mad at me because I'm gonna quote from a couple parts of it. It, it hasn't uh, been uh, released yet, but your journey uh, to truth from, from seeing your grandfather as this hero of the family. You had a bust of him on, on your desk, I, I believe. And this emotion that you went through, this conflict, this revelation upon revelation, can you can feel your, your, your heart sickness, your vertigo, your, your agony of what you went through over a period of, of many, many years to get to this truth. And, and, and I'll get in a little while to Grant's uh, intersection with you on this story. But, but I want to start, uh, uh, Sylvia, with, with, with um, a, one part of the book that I want to read. And every, everybody should get this book. It is incredibly powerful, both as a, a one woman's journey and, and as, as a manifesto about uh, a Holocaust denial and what has gone on in Lithuania and Grant's efforts to, to try to get justice, uh, to try to get the government to acknowledge uh, what happened. Uh, you made a deathbed promise to your mother uh, to, to, to finish this book, and you were asked at one point by your grandmother, but I believe, how's the book going? And you said, slowly, but I'll finish it, don't worry. And you thought that would give her great comfort. And what she said next, I think, started to change your life. Don't write it, she said flatly with more energy in her voice than I had heard in months. Just leave it alone. What do you mean leave it alone? This was hardly the response I had expected. It's best to just let history lie. There's no need to dig around. But you couldn't do that, Sylvia, both as a granddaughter and as, as evident in this book, a very talented journalist. Your search for the truth uh, uh, took hold of you at that time, I think. Yes, when she when she told me that, I I didn't even know the story. You know, at the time I thought she just wanted to kind of make my life easier because she knew how much her daughter, my mother, struggled with the story for years. And and I only at that point thought it was, you know, what I always call the heroic side of his life and how he bravely fought the communists. So um I only got a hint of what the, what she might have meant by that maybe a few months after that when I was burying her in Lithuania. And um, shortly after that, I went with my brother to visit the school named after my grandfather. And that's when the huge rumor, what I, what I still thought was a rumor then, the huge revelation uh, came up and it was the first time I had ever heard this. Um, well, let's talk about that for just a second, Sylvia, because there was actually a grammar school there named for your grandfather. And the man there that you talked to said, I got a, gr a lot of grief at first, as you put it, for naming it after him. And you didn't know why. You said the comment perplexed me. All eyes were on me as if I were a great celebrity. I struggled to conceal my confusion. He was accused of being a Jew killer 
whispered the director of the school. My eyes met Ray's. He too was aghast, accused of being a Jew killer. What could the director mean? Had we heard correctly? I studied his face for a moment, feeling off balance, then looked around the room at the teachers and others assembled. Who were all these people? Who was I? Who was I, you ask yourself, Sylvia? Or my mother or my grandmother or my grandfather? My mind whirled in disbelief. There must be some mistake. It can't be true. And the rest of the book is essentially your assiduous search as a journalist to find out what the truth was, going through your family papers, going to visit Holocaust sites, going to, uh, to, to uncover previously um, unseen documents that would prove either your grandfather's complicity in the killing of thousands of Jews or not. And, and I think, it, it, talk a little bit about how you were torn between your love of family. You didn't want to, you didn't want to disappoint or betray them. You didn't want to do, a, as you repeat in the book several times, uh, go against the Lithuanian's government and the Lithuanian people. And yet you were, a, you were trained as a journalist and, and it's remarkable what we were able to find out. Talk about how that conflict was, was possessed you as you tried to write this book. Um, yeah, it was, it was a possession of sorts, uh, truly, because I grew up loving uh, my grandfather, even though I had never met him. Just all these stories were handed down, loving stories handed down by my mother and my grandmother. Uh, my mother had letters from him from a Nazi concentration camp in which he wrote a little fairy tale for her. And she would read parts of that fairy tale to me when I was a little girl. So he was this larger than life figure to me. And uh, growing up in Chicago, I, I really revered being Lithuanian. I felt it was a very special thing. It was, it was given to me that way. Um, so, so when I was confronted with this idea that he uh, might have been a Holocaust perpetrator, I just, I, my, my first reaction was just to go into denial. I could not believe it. I, I just could not believe it. I could not believe it. And um, as his granddaughter, I really did not want to believe it. I really was told it's just communist propaganda. And I held on to that thinking it's just the Russian story. They don't want Lithuanians to have heroes. And uh, for many, many years, <laughs> I was guilty of thinking that. Um, but I think, you know, uh, the journalist was kind of battling with the granddaughter all the time inside my head and my heart. And, um, and it was the journalist that eventually won in pushing the granddaughter to say, look, you have to, you have to look at this. You have to see what this is. And um, when the granddaughter finally was realizing the horrors of what he was involved in, you know, I, I went into depression, you know, practically a crisis over it uh, and coming to terms with it. And I had to just let the material down for a while because it took a long time for me to crawl back to it and, and to try to assemble it again. So I think I went through every single emotion possible. That, like comes, across, that comes across in the book and it's not easy to express that that uh, in 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 text in in words, but but it comes across. I felt it. I had to I had to put it aside myself for a while and then come back to it. So I can't imagine how you felt. Grant, uh, interspersed between the chapters uh, in the book are various findings of essentially a court uh, in Vilnius. Uh, essentially saying, no, this can't be true. Don't come back to us. Uh, I, you, you were on a, a, a different but parallel track and you eventually would intersect with Sylvia and trying to get to the truth of this, to try to get the Lithuanian government to confront it, it, that country's role in the Holocaust. Talk about that a little bit. Well, John, many years ago, um, I, I went to my grandfather's village and I was saying Kaddish over the death pits where, where my cousins are, were, were thrown into. And I was with an academic and I said to her, who did the shooting? Who, who actually killed them? The academic said to me, it was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka. I knew nothing about Noreka at that point. So I came back to the United States and I started researching Noreka and Der Spiegel magazine in Germany had actually exposed in 1984 
that six years before Lithuania regained independence, that Noreka was the murderer. Um, and the more I researched, I discovered that Noreka is held as one of Lithuania's greatest national heroes. So I thought, this has to be a mistake. I mean, they, they can't be they can't be honoring a mass murderer of Lithuanian citizens that just happen to be Jews as one of their primary heroes. So I wrote a letter to the government and I said, hey, guys, uh, I don't know if you know, but you've made a terrible mistake over here. And through the process, I uncovered that it is a pervasive program within the Lithuanian government to rehabilitate mass murderers or Holocaust perpetrators into national heroes and deny their crimes. So when Sylvia actually approached me and introduced herself uh, two and a half, three years ago, she said uh, what the Lithuanian government had done about her grandfather was one of the greatest criminal cover-ups of the 20th century. At that point, she only knew about her grandfather. She didn't know about the at least a dozen more perpetrators that they've done the same thing to. Well, let me just so, stop you. Grant, let me just stop you for one second, because as I recall from reading the book, Sylvia essentially wrote to you and then, and then you connected. And one of the things that Sylvia said, said is that she was so relieved that you didn't hold it against her, that her grandfather had essentially murdered many members of your family, cousins, I believe. Isn't that right? Yeah. Yes. So talk more about uh, that. Talk more about what you thought when you, when, you, when you realized all these connections when Sylvia contacted you. Well, John, I, I don't believe in heritage guilt. A, Jews for the last 2,000 years have been blamed for all sorts of things from thousands of years ago. Um, heritage guilt is, is, to me, an absurd construct. If, if, if people are today supporting Holocaust perpetrators as their heroes, uh, I consider them guilty. But Sylvia was saying she doesn't consider her grandfather a hero. She's absolutely appalled. At, at his criminal conduct um, and his murders. So there was no way to hold Sylvia. There's no way to hold the average Lithuanian responsible because they're not. But those government departments that are literally denying aspects of the Holocaust and covering up um, the crimes and elevating mass Holocaust perpetrators into national hero status, those people are guilty. Um, and it is my determination to expose as much of it as I am capable of doing. So, Sylvia, uh, you describe in, in excruciating detail, as a matter of fact, how you and I, uh, I believe there's a Holocaust guide by the name of Simon, uh, a site guide, um, went and, and I just how painful that must have been for you to go visit these sites and you gradually, because you're, you're doing this, this incredibly meticulous job of trying to reconstruct the past through documents, through even talking to people who were, who were alive at, at, at that time. That just must have been so difficult for you. And I don't want to go into it, but you eventually would be slowed down, down and, and this book would be delayed for years because of a personal family tragedy that you had to endure. Uh, it, it, it really is amazing. And I, and I, I highly recommend the book. I, I, I'm not just saying that. And you should read Sylvia's op-ed uh, in the New York Times uh, this morning. And I'm so glad that you, did, you were able to do that. On, on this in, in important day. But uh, when you were going from site to site and uncovering all this, how many times did you think about turning back? How many times? I don't know. The number is so large. I don't think I can even let you know. I, it was almost every day. It's, it was almost a daily battle with me. Uh, but, but the story, there, there was something so strong about the story that it was almost magnetic to me. And every time I tried to put it down, I just got pulled back to it. Mm -hmm. And it was like stronger than me uh, and my own will in some ways. It, it just truly overpowered me and, and took me along 
the rush of it. And I, and I just had to follow wherever the trail would lead. You know, it's really important, Grant, and we're talking obviously on, 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 on the Holocaust Remembrance Day about denialism and distortion uh, of history because Sylvia's story talks talks about that and talks about the, the, the denialism in Lithuania. You have pursued this uh, assiduously yourself. Talk about, because I think this is a, for many people, either an unknown or forgotten part of the Holocaust, which you have dedicated yourself and which Sylvia's book will help illuminate. I mean, a lot of people do not know about this portion of, of the Holocaust. Am I right? Correct. The, the, the murders in Lithuania, um, began before the Germans arrived. So they, Lithuanians had already, had already started launching it. Um, the Lithuanian leadership was openly proposing elimination of Jews from Lithuania. Sylvia's own grandfather was one of the first, Sylvia's grandfather wrote the Mein Kampf of Lithuania. Um, it was the leadership of the country, the provisional government, the interim prime minister, the, it, it, it was the cream of Lithuanian society, political society, that was proposing and implemented the elimination of Jews. Now, Lithuania has successfully changed the narrative. They say it was the degenerates. It wasn't the degenerates. Lithuania says, uh, we mourn the loss of the Jews murdered by the Nazis. But there were under a thousand Nazis in the country. The Lithuanian Jews were murdered mostly by Lithuanians who rounded them up and did the killings and, and raped the woman and suffocated the babies. The, the Lithuania actually has a government department called the Genocide Center, which is tasked with revising the national history to rewrite it so that Lithuanians are not as culpable. And their foreign ministry has the objective to market to Jews and, and everybody else that Lithuania is a Jew-loving country, that this horror happened because others did it. But it wasn't others that did it. It was Lithuanian leadership that proposed it, that implemented it. And then when the Nazis arrived and Nazis facilitated it, implemented the rest of it. And one cannot get past, one has to have truth in order to have reconciliation. And Lithuania would very much like to have reconciliation based on a fraudulent narrative. And that reconciliation would collapse when people inevitably learn about it. So I'm all for reconciliation based on truth. And truth is not there through all of my lawsuits. And there have been very many. We have shown that there is no path to truth within Lithuania. It will only be able to be imposed from the outside. And certainly, uh, your your book, uh, Sylvia, is going to be uh, a, a living document that is, and people who read it, uh, unless they are are tendentiously motivated to be blind to what is in it, and 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 Grant has described to some extent some of that attitude. This is this is a historical document. It's almost unassailable. Is it important to you? That, that, that Grant's work, that, that, that the acknowledgement by Lithuania occurs in the wake of the publication of your book. I very much hope that happens, um, that, that in many ways was the motivation for me to continue and push through this at great personal psychological cost. Um, I just kept thinking this book has to come out and it has to come out in a big way because I knew if it came out in a small way, it wouldn't make a dent in Lithuania's consciousness. So I really knew it had to come out in some kind of a big way. And um, I, I hope it will, because that's the only way it's going to make Lithuania pay attention. So, so talk about, talk about um, uh, the pushback you got from from various uh, uh, sources during during this 
uh, uh, Sylvia, uh, and, and it's two pronged, I think, from inside Lithuania, from the government, from people in Lithuania who were in denial of what had happened, and your own family, of course, right? Where your grandfather was this a figure of reverence where, where, where he was a, a hero. He had been murdered in, in, in a concentration camp. He died, I think, at 36. Is that, is that right? And, and so uh, think about, talk a little bit about how hard it was, the forces you were going up against, both in your own family and in Lithuania, to try to get this done. He, he was uh, executed in a KGB prison by the Russians, the horrible Russians. He, I'm going to show you something, if you don't mind. It's kind of emblematic of, um, you know, the heroism. This is the cross of the Vitis that was given to my mother in 1997 by the president of Lithuania, uh, Algirdas Brazauskas, at that time. And I was next to her. I went on this trip with her to Lithuania with my brother, specifically so she could, you know, receive this. And um, this is the highest honor anyone in Lithuania could receive posthumously. It's the highest possible honor. And of course, after my mother's death, I, you know, um, I took anything connected to the book and this was among among the relics. So, so I, I, I'm coming up against the highest honor given from the country of Lithuania. And people just don't let that go. People just do not let that go. And so my own family is mortified. My, fa my father's, I mean, you know, he still loves me, but he's upset about this book. And his brothers, and my uncles, also don't think it's a good idea. If my mother and grandmother were alive, I would have never written it. I would have never, I just wouldn't have been able to do it. I just wouldn't have been able to do it. Do the members of your family uh, who are alive now, you say they don't want the book, do they not believe it or they just don't think, or they think to go back to where we began, you should just let history lie? I think they just believe you should just let history lie. It's going to make Lithuania look bad. By extension, it'll make, you know, any Lithuanian, I guess, feels poorly reflected by the story and they don't want to feel bad because it's shameful. It's, it's horrifically shameful. And uh, it's very difficult to get to that point in your mind and your heart to even believe that this is true. So um, I, I know we're probably getting close to the end. I expected Dylan to give me the hook long ago, but I'm going to keep talking. And, 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 and so uh, I think we have about five minutes left. Let's Grant. Let's talk about where where uh, we we go from here in terms of what you and Sylvia both want to see happen, and what seems to me incredibly important because you can't just let history lie. You can't. This the, the, this is what Holocaust Remembrance Day is all about, right? You you've, you've got to bring the truth out. You don't think it's going to happen from within. You've certainly tried prodigiously for years to do that. So so what what moves the ball here? Is it the American government getting uh, involved? There's a resolution I believe coming coming uh, in, in Congress, but that you know that that's a piece of paper. What's it going to take? I'll, I'll tell you what it's going to take. First of all, John, we, we've got to be very careful to separate out the Lithuanian people from the Lithuanian government. The average Lithuanian citizen is really a fine, decent human being that has absolutely no idea of this. The government has created this narrative. They even threatened me with criminal charges for submitting a historical study. The courts, government, um, criminal authorities are absolutely aligned in denying the facts of the case. And the, this the lawsuit will be filed against the government of Lithuania in the European Court of Human Rights next month. Um, one of the things that, that the Lithuanian government has done was to use U.S. congressional documents to completely misrepresent um, another one of the Holocaust perpetrators. And then in having the U.S. Congress address this, the Lithuanian government issued insults to the members of Congress and just increased the deceptions. There is only one thing that Lithuania cares about, and that is their NATO membership. 
Um, last year, the United States gave Lithuania $88 million in, in aid, and our military is in Lithuania defending them. There will have to be some position taken by the U.S. government that this has gone too far, that in denying and distorting the Holocaust, they are insulting members of Congress, saying they know more about Congress and law than members of Congress and U.S. lawyers. Ultimately, this can only move towards reconciliation, and reconciliation can only be based on truth. So it will take a lot of work, a lot of time, and eventually the new generation of Lithuanians will be truthful, and Jews and Lithuanians will be able to reconcile based on truth. And from there, we will put a new foot forward. So we only have about a minute left, Grant. Um, the loss will just be asking for an acknowledgement of the truth by the government. Is it that simple? Um, it, it, it's a very complicated lawsuit because um, there is a right to truth within European law. Um, the Lithuanian government has absolutely negated that right to truth. They've refused uh, to address any of the facts. They have not examined the facts of the case um, in, in the hope that they would eventually be able to push everybody away and we would forget about it. But there are 220,000 murdered Jews in Lithuanian death pits <coughs> that deserve to have the truth. And that truth must out. And whatever it'll take from myself and Sylvia, um, she and I represent the next generation of Lithuanians who can get along, who have mutual respect based on truth. And the lawsuit in the European Court of Human Rights will be about the right to truth. Sylvia I, I, and Grant, I, 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 we have to wrap up. I, I could talk more about this. It, it's, it's not just fascinating. It's, it's, it's somewhat emotional to even just imagine it and to have read Sylvia's book. I, I, I congratulate you on, on, on your accomplishment, uh, Sylvia. It, it is remarkable. Uh, I hope there is at least some sense of relief after having done this, that, 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 that leavens the pain of all this uh, a little bit? Uh, 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 do you feel that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it all started as a deathbed promise to my mother, so I fulfilled the promise. Indeed, you, you did. So Grant and Sylvia, uh, good luck in, 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 in what you were doing. Uh, I, I really, I, 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 I'm not using the word loosely, I'm honored to be here with you, so thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for having us, John. You bet. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Thank you, guys. So, so thank you, uh, thank you, John, Sylvia, and Grant. Um, this was a, a very touching uh, session again, and and uh, uh, John, you did a phenomenal job um, um, sharing the story. So, thank you again. Um, and I guess we will move on to our next uh, segment. Um, Lena, are you ready? Let me unmute you here. Are you? Fascinated by this story there you are. Because when I heard um, Sylvia's courage uh, to tell this story, which is definitely a daunting story to discover about your own family, and I look at Grant's persistence and his courage as well, uh, and and really the fact that he states that no resolution can be found without truth uh, is really something that that is universal. And I must say that that is the struggle for the Armenian community is having accountability and truth by the Turkish government has been something that has really eluded us. And the um, pattern of denialism, denialism since the days of the Ottoman Empire to today is a challenge. It's a wound that has not healed for the Armenian community. Uh, and really, without truth, there can be no resolution. They can, there can be no justice. And unfortunately, the crimes against humanity continue to, throughout history and to this day uh, because of that type of denialism uh, and lack of accountability. 
So I'm Absolutely. fascinated by this story. There's so many parallels between our communities and our histories. And I really look forward to working together with the Jewish community uh, and, and working to find the truth and find justice. Absolutely. Well, well thank you, Lena. And um, <laughs> perfect. Well, thank you, Lena. So it's 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 a great it's a great uh, segue to our, our next segment. Um, and again, thank you to um, thank you to Ralston, Grant, and Sylvia. That was a, a, an amazing segment there, um, uh, talking about the Holocaust and, and their connection to it. Um, Lena, I'm going to let you take the lead here, and uh, we'll discuss the um, the Armenian genocide and your connection and its relevance to today. I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Dylan. And I, I want to say we have a tremendous panel today. I, I'm going to go read that book, and I'm already fascinated by the story because there's so many parallels between our histories. Uh, and it's also very interesting to understand as an attorney that the pursuit of human justice and human rights through the European courts is definitely something that needs to be pursued when an, uh, a country doesn't acknowledge its own past or tries to revise history and tell a different narrative which is unfortunately the experience of the Armenian community and Armenians of Armenia dealing with the Turkish government and the Azeri government. Uh, I want to make a few brief comments and, and tell a, a brief family history before I go on to our panelists and get to talk to them. But I want to start by saying that in the infamous words of Adolf Hitler to his generals in 1939, before the Nazi invasion into Poland, he stated, and his Nazi generals used the Armenian genocide as a type of blueprint and took note that the Ottoman perpetrators were never held accountable for their crimes against humanity. In fact, there was a war tribunal held against the three perpetrators, Enver Pasha, uh, Talat, and Jamal, and ultimately the Europeans uh, gave them a pass and they were never held accountable. They, actually, they were sentenced to death uh, and that those, um, they eventually fled to Germany and into Europe and they were never held accountable. Perhaps if they had been held accountable, the course of history would have changed. And I think that's something that we always think about as Armenians is that if the Turks or the Turkish Ottoman Turks had ultimately been held accountable, would there be a different course of history for humanity and would the Jewish Holocaust ultimately, would they have been emboldened, would Hitler have been emboldened to perpetrate such a, a gross and disgusting, uh, you know, attack and crime against humanity as the Jewish Holocaust? So, as many of you know, on April 24th, 1915, the Turkish Ottoman Turks gathered the, the intelligentsia of the Armenians who were in the, in the Ottoman Empire in their ancient homeland and displayed, severed their heads, beheaded them, and displayed them before the Armenians. These, uh, the Armenian population, they masterminded a human rights catastrophe on an epic scale, which had never been done, had been unprecedented in the modern era. And interestingly, at the time, it was the Industrial Revolution, and they used all types of uh, new technology to perpetrate those crimes, such as railroads, mass transit, uh, communication to transport the Armenians from their homes and to ultimately lead to their demise. Uh, Raphael Lemkin, who was a Polish scholar, uh, coined the term Armenian genocide after looking at what happened to the Armenians. And we became a type of prototype for, uh, for crimes against humanity. Um, ultimately, we, we lost 1.5 million Armenians perished through the Holocaust through many ways, including the execution of our men, torture, unspeakable crimes, and the infamous death marches, which took the men, women, the women, the children, and the elderly through the Derzor Desert. Till today, if you go to the Derzor Desert, you can find the bones of our martyrs in those sands that stay there, that show evidence of the suffering of our people. I want to tell a, a brief story that will depict, tell uh, what, as a granddaughter of Armenian genocide survivors, uh, that we've heard so many stories, we've grown up with these terrible stories, and they haunt us to this day. 
And I want to bring that back to modern times. But one of the stories that really resonated with me was first the story told by Lois Tarkanian about how Jerry Tarkanian's father during the Armenian genocide witnessed his own father taken by the Turkish soldiers and beheaded before his very eyes. He will never, of course, forget that he had this type of history. And Lois Tarkanian at our centennial commemoration told this very dramatic story about the, the tragedy and the horror of his, her, his own grandfather, his father witnessing his father beheaded. Everyone in our community who now live in the United States has this story. Uh, I personally have four stories and my husband's family also has those stories. Uh, grandfather Arakel's story, who's my father, my husband's grandfather, story still haunts me and my children, of course, who have, told, have been told these stories in an age-appropriate fashion. But he was seven or eight years old, and as they were forced to leave their homes and they were being deporter, deported, his father took him to a bridge and left him there and said, I'm going to go get food. He kissed him goodbye, and he was going to go get food and come back to retrieve him. Little Arakel was waiting at this bridge and he waited and waited what felt like an eternity and his father never ever returned. And all he can remember, he could remember for the rest of his life was the last kiss of his father by the bridge. Afterwards, his family uh, was deported and they were on a death march. His grandmother, uh, his mother, his grandfather and his younger brother. And ultimately, his mother didn't believe that she would survive because she put her brother and uh, put her son and his, uh, Arakel and his brother in a carriage and had them taken to an orphanage. Um, that was the last time that he saw his mother. At the orphanage, uh, the Turks would take the children who were sickly and dead and they would put them in mass graves. Arakel was very frightened for himself and his brother and his brother was slightly sick. One day, Arakel was out and doing, he was not aware where his brother was. And he came to find out, find out that his brother, while he was not there, had been taken alive and put into a mass grave. So these are the tragic type of stories that each one of us carries as grandchildren of genocide survivors. Um, and they haunt us. Um, but turning to 2020, you know, we as Armenians have told these stories, we have erected monuments, we have rebuilt our lives. But in 2020, it becomes ever more clear that when you don't hold the perpetrators of genocide accountable, they come back. And that's what President Erdogan with Turkey and Aliyev of Azerbaijan launched an attack on September 27th. Prior to the attack, uh, Erdogan stated that he would finish the job of his forefathers in rhetoric that was clear to the parliament of his intent to continue to eradicate the Armenian population. And Aliyev, President Aliyev, has also uttered those same words of talking about Armenians as dogs that should be slaughtered, we should be driven from our lands, and they have actually Make, made good on their promise. They've attacked the Armenians of Artsakh and again exiled us from our own homelands uh, as recently as September 27th in a 44 day war, which was launched against us again using all types of technology that would basically incapacitate our community and in a genocidal intent to eradicate us from our own homeland. So if the message from history isn't clear that we need to stop denialism. Denialism and hate are the seed for uh, genocides to continue. When perpetrators do not feel that they will be held accountable, they are emboldened to, to perpetrate those crimes again. Um, on a final note, I would like to say that uh, these uh, hate crimes have come as close to American shores. Um, most recently in San Francisco in August and September of 2020, around the time of the attack against the Armenians of Artsakh, the Armenian Church and Community Center in San Francisco, where I grew up, was 
uh, set on fire and completely burned down the community center through arson. And the Armenian uh, center, that which has the Armenian school and community center, was vandalized with all types of anti-Armenian hate all over graffiti, all over the school grounds, as well as gunshots. So the lesson is that a crime unpunished and without justice makes this world a dangerous place for all of humankind. On that note, I think it's, it was so appropriate to have Roxanne McCustion. We're privileged to have you, Roxanne. She is the executive director of the Armenian, of, I'm sorry, of the Genocide Education Project and it's a fabulous uh, organization that has uh, a curriculum that is being implemented about genocide and Holocaust education nationwide. We're proud to have her. And I wanted to start by asking Roxanne uh, if you could give me a brief history about your family and why you got involved with genocide education. Sure, thank you so much, Lena, and thank all of you. Uh, for having me today on this Holocaust Remembrance Day. Uh, commemorating the Holocaust is such an important way to remember and to rededicate ourselves to learning. And as we've done today with this amazing story I hadn't known about, uh, Sylvia's, and uh, and to be able to, to give us the power to, to act when faced with decisions uh, for preventing hatred to be acted on. Um, so yes, very similar to you, Lena. I uh, grew up as a child of, or a, a descendant, a grandchild in my case, of genocide survivors on both sides. So all four of my grandparents were uh, amongst the few to survive and uh, and get out. Uh, they each had uh, somewhat similar yet very individual stories, uh, one being hidden in a kitchen cabinet of a neighbor until the roundup of her town, uh, town's Armenian people uh, was done and then and then having to escape uh, out of the area. You know, another also escaping in the darkness of night uh, before the roundup in their town happened and having to trek across Turkey and then over the, the Russian controlled Armenian border. Um, another one of my grandparents uh, was hidden actually by Kurdish neighbors in their barn for many weeks until it was at least safe enough to uh, escape um, th uh, all the way through Siberia and Russia, all the way to Japan. Uh, all of my grandparents um, then were able to get to the West and my grandparents uh, came here to the United States. That's where my mother was born and, and I was born, of course. Um, so yeah, that's how it became uh, an ever-present part of my life. So Roxanne, that's, thank you for sharing those personal stories. And each one of them has their own tragic uh, line of, of, and miracle, really, of yeah. survival that yeah. are compelling stories. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the Genocide Education Project, what it's about and what you've done? Sure. So uh, throughout my school years, you know, it became more and more obvious and concerning to me that uh, modern history courses, especially in high school, were, were missing a huge, uh, there was a, a huge section missing, uh, and that was the Armenian Genocide. You know, it should fit naturally into instruction about World War I. Uh, it was a major, the, the most significant humanitarian crisis that happened during World War I, yet it's often bypassed uh, when teaching uh, about this era. Uh, but in 1985 in California, uh, the legislature passed uh, an Armenian Genocide Education uh, Bill. And, um, and then we kind of waited and waited and we saw that it wasn't really being implemented in schools. And the reason was it was simple and understandable. Teachers were not equipped to teach about this. They hadn't 
learned about it in their schooling. They hadn't uh, been trained about it when they got their teaching certificates for social studies. Uh, and it's a very sensitive topic, genocide, and it, and it takes some professional development to, to learn how to teach it appropriately, um, and particularly in this case. So uh, had its own, you know, has its own challenges. So I and others formed a committee to address this. We went to my local school district, um, a school board, uh, the San Francisco Unified School District, and they agreed with, uh, with this, with our approach. And we worked with them, with their curriculum development department for uh, more than a year to develop curriculum, to develop teaching materials that would be able to be incorporated into the existing guidelines and framework for education, uh, particularly in the modern uh, world history courses that are usually in 10th grade. Uh, and uh, we make those available broadly now all throughout the country. And, um, and we give teacher training uh, workshops about a, a full day teacher training uh, to help teachers feel comfortable and empowered to teach this subject. That's wonderful, Roxanne. You guys have done a, a tremendous job, I've heard, in California and other states, and we look forward to having your input uh, and all the, the your wisdom and uh, resources when we can hopefully work on getting the legislation passed for the Holocaust and Armenian Genocide Education Bill. Can you tell me a little bit about the Armenian Genocide and how it is compelling as a case study and prototype as the first genocide of the modern era? And what are some historical uh, situations or parallels, connections between the genocide, uh, Armenian Genocide and the Jewish Holocaust? I'd be happy to. So Lena, you did a good job in giving some of the basics of what happened, uh, uh, what the Armenian Genocide is, and so did our uh, colleagues uh, earlier who spoke. Uh, but um, to give a little bit of context, you know, right uh, on the eve of World War I, uh, some years leading up to that, the Ottoman Empire uh, was losing some territories and they were feeling more and more vulnerable uh, as World War I approached. And the new leadership of the Ottoman Empire at that time developed a new ideology that they decided to carry out. And it was an ideology referred to by historians as pan-Turanism uh, or pan-Turkism, basically the idea that Turkey or what remain the, uh, the Turkish nation should uh, just consists of Turks, and uh, they needed to rid the country of all other peoples. Even though the Armenians had predated, uh, pre-existed the Turks uh, in that region, they were indigenous to the to that region for um, uh, several thousands of years. They were now a minority population, although the largest minority within the Ottoman Empire. But so they were, you know, kind of the number one targets for this new ideology. And, um, you know, 1.5 million Armenians were, were annihilated, were, were killed, as you said, but that constituted more, uh, you know, about half or more than half of the population of Armenians. So it's, it's kind of hard to imagine. Um, and it's not just that they were killed, but that the Armenian population at the time was then completely dispossessed of all its properties, its personal properties, people's families' properties and businesses, but also their community properties. Over centuries, the, all, all those ancient churches, Armenian was the, Armenia was the first nation to adopt Christianity uh, in the world. So its churches are the oldest. The churches, the schools, the hospitals, all of those were stolen. Uh, given over to Turks. Uh, even today, so many prominent locations in Turkey uh, were previous, were, were Armenian, is Armenian land. Even the U United States Air Base, uh, even the Turkish president's, you know, very palatial home. So, um, you know, it's a key case study, especially for genocide education courses, uh, for numerous reasons. First of all, the word genocide 
was invented by the Polish Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin. Uh, looking at the Armenian case, he, do, he invented this word before the Holocaust happened, and partially because he witnessed, he saw what was what happened to the Armenians, and he was very concerned about, you know, uh, what might happen to his own people because the rise of Nazism was already happening. And, you know, he said, you know, we need a law, uh, an international law against such a crime, and we can't have a law unless we name it. So we'll name it genocide, uh, genos nation and side killing. Why he said is killing of a million people, why should it be a lesser crime than killing just a single individual? We have so many laws about murdering one individual. So that in itself makes the Armenian case very important to study as this, as you said, Lena, the first modern, the modern case. Uh, and as I said, being the most significant human rights event of World War I, also being considered by historians as the prototype case. It kind of checks off all the boxes of things that constitute actions that constitute a genocide with the way it was carried out. And of course, that very uh, kind of shock relationship that it has to uh, to the Holocaust itself and other su subsequent genocides. You know, the massive scale of the Armenian genocide and the lack of the accountability um, by the Turkish government leaders uh, was noted by Adolf Hitler himself when he, I, I think I, I um, your your audio went off at the time for me, Lena, so I'm not sure if everybody heard that, but Adolf Hitler's quote to his generals when he was giving them a pep talk before invading Poland was, you know, something to the effect of, you, you don't have to worry about all the destruction you're going to uh, commit, but then he said, who today remembers the annihilation of the Armenians? So he took his lesson from the Armenian case that if you do it good enough, if you do it well enough, um, nobody will remember uh, the victors, uh, the victors write the history books after all. So uh, we know now that Hitler, um, it was more than just that quote. He studied the Armenian case very carefully and many of his right hand men, many of uh, uh, during the Holocaust actually were in Turkey during the Armenian genocide. They were, they were allied with Turkey. They were advising Turkey. They were building Turkey's railroad for it, a railroad that transported many Armenians into the countryside to then be put on death marches. Um, so many connections between the two cases, which only were, which only were about 20 years apart. So it was very clear, very uh, uh, people remembered it. And then of course, the main perpetrator of the Armenian case, Talat, who is considered by Armenians as, as their Adolf Hitler. Uh, he fled before he was put on trial. Uh, he fled and where did he go to live very comfortably? Germany. And it was well, well known that he was there by the German government. Um, so there's so many cases. And then of course we feel that it's very important for American students and Nevada students to understand the American historical connections to this case. If it weren't for a, the massive uh, humanitarian aid effort that happened right after the war to save Armenian genocide survivors, many of us wouldn't be here today. Uh, uh, many, if not most, Armenian Americans are descendants of survivors who were helped by Americans. The American aid effort was blows your mind now the amount of money that was given to help Armenians. In today's dollars, it was $2 billion. And it was led, another very important connection, it was led by the ambassador to Turkey who came back home, who, who was so distraught that he couldn't stop Turkey from committing its genocide. When he came back, he started a relief fund uh, this was the Jewish American um, uh, ambassador, Henry Morgenthau, who then wrote his memoirs, which is one of the key testimonials of the Armenian genocide. So for all of these reasons, it is um, 
kind of essential learning the Armenian genocide in any look at either World War One history, modern world history, and the Industrial uh, Revolution, how it it enabled very good uh, things to happen, but it also enabled mass swift destruction of peoples uh, and the American history and how it connects with this and how students can feel proud of, of the uh, humanity of Americans that helped saved us. Save us, Absolutely. excuse me. Thank you so much, Roxanne. And I know that we had prior discussed about how the uh, the Nazis got the idea of, perhaps got the idea of gas chambers mm -hmm. by the way the Ottoman Turkish soldiers would trap Armenians inside churches, set the churches on fire and let them all suffocate and burn alive. Or they would do the same type of thing inside of caves. So definitely they were taking notes and they saw that the Ottoman Turks got away with it. Uh, interestingly, you know, when Grant was speaking about the deification and, and national heroes, uh, President Aliyev recently in, in the victory parade they had after the war in Artsakh mentioned Enver Pasha, who was one of the masterminds of the Armenian genocide as a mm -hmm. national hero. So those types of things, those reverberations of genocide and denialism, <laughs> Uh, and you know, uh, rewriting of of our history of genocide history are happening for Jews, for Armenians, and whether it's in Lithuania, Lithuania or in Azerbaijan, we have to address and get back to the truth. Um, thank you so much, Roxanne, for enlightening us. And I would like to turn also now to our honorary consul of uh, of Nevada, the of the Armenian Republic, the Republic of Armenia. Adrushan Andy Armenian, uh, and I would like to start by asking him about uh, Andy. Hi, welcome. And I would like to ask you, uh, Adrushan, do you have a personal story uh, that you can tell us about your family and and your history with the Armenian genocide? Uh, thank you, Lena, and also thanks uh, thanks Dylan for organizing this session, uh, and thanks Dan for painfully describing the uh, history. Uh, it's very painful. Uh, Lena, prior to answering uh, to that, I would like to go back and uh, uh, refer to the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And this morning I was uh, uh, checking the White House and uh, uh, they issued a statement by President uh, Biden uh, uh, regarding the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And uh, obviously, if you're uh, surfing the internet, uh, most countries, they are uh, uh, talking about the International uh, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Unfortunately, due to COVID-19, most commemorations are being held uh, either online or uh, virtual. Uh, I would like to, however, read uh, the last paragraph from uh, President Biden's statement regarding uh, the Holocaust. He says, the Holocaust was no accident of history. It occurred because too many governments adopted and implemented hate-filled hate laws, policies, and practices to dehumanize entire groups of people. And too many individuals stood by silently. Uh, I personally would like to go back to uh, the points that uh, Roxanne was making and uh, emphasize the importance of uh, education, whether it is on local or federal level. Uh, and I strongly support that in the state of Nevada, uh, we uh, get on all government levels, better uh, education of both the Holocaust and the, and the genocide. Uh, having said that, uh, Armenians commemorate the uh, Armenian genocide uh, around the world on the 24th of uh, uh, April and uh, as the Armenian Remembrance Day. Here, uh, I would like to uh, mention a very brief uh, uh, personal uh, history where I only had uh, my only surviving grandmother uh, was, uh, I was 15 years old when she passed away. Uh, and 
all the time that I remember her, she was wearing black, remembering her husband, her brothers and relatives who were killed during the uh, Armenian genocide during World War I. So that, uh, whenever I uh, remember the April 24th uh, commemorations, that is a picture that will, I, I will never be able to, to forget. Uh, I'm glad to mention that here in the state of Nevada, uh, both at the state level uh, and on the city level, uh, Clark County, city of Las Vegas, North Las Vegas have, and Henderson, they have all recognized uh, the Armenian genocide with different proclamations or resolutions. And uh, also on the centennial uh, commemoration of the Armenian genocide in 2015, we were able to uh, build a monument at Clark County's uh, Sunset Park uh, dedicated to all genocides. Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Andrushan, for sharing that personal history and also about how proud we are to have the Armenian Genocide Monument that commemorates the Holocaust and other genocides as well in Sunset Park. That was a, a very personal thing for our community here that we got to work on together. On that note, um, I would like to ask you a little bit if you could tell us about some of the iconic Armenian Americans of Nevada who were descendants of Armenian Genocide survivors or children of genocide survivors and how they came to Nevada and their impact on the state of Nevada. We have some famous ones. <laughs> Sure. Whenever you uh, mention about the uh, famous uh, Armenian American Nevadans, uh, two people come to mind. First of all, it's uh, Kirk Korian, who was uh, born in Fresno, California, and uh, made uh, Las Vegas his home and uh, developed the MGM empire, the casinos and the hotels. But at the same time, he was a major philanthropist. During his lifetime, he donated over a billion dollars to various charities, as well as uh, after he passed away, he left over two billion dollars to various charities. And uh, I would like to say also that uh, UNLV is one of the major uh, beneficiaries of uh, Kirkir Korean, as well as the uh, UNLV Medical School, which is uh, uh, under development currently. Uh, the other individual that uh, everybody loves and uh, remembers is uh, Jerry Tarkanian. And again, he is a survivor of the Armenian genocide, born in Ohio and moved to Fresno and then eventually to uh, Las Vegas. And he, uh, uh, the famous basketball coach, uh, made uh, put UNLV on the world's map. Yeah. Absolutely. We're very proud of our Armenian Americans who've contributed uh, to the landscape of Las Vegas and made it the great uh, city and, and great state that it is of Nevada. And on that note as well, I often think about how the world would have been a very different place if six million Jews hadn't perished in the Holocaust, if the 1.5 million Armenians had survived or there had never been an Armenian genocide. In that world, I always think about all the scientists, ingenious writers, all the people that would have contributed to this world. And on that note, I was wondering if you could tell us about a recent Armenian American who's made a major national impact during the COVID-19 pandemic that you can mention to our viewers as well. Well, uh, it's very interesting then uh, that uh, earlier we were mentioning that due to COVID-19, most of the uh, International Holocaust uh, Remembrance Day is being called virtual or online uh, due to the COVID. And uh, it's interesting to highlight that one of the inventors, one of the scientists who uh, came up with the uh, vaccine, the founder of uh, Moderna uh, lab Laboratories, his name is uh, Mr. Nubar Afeyan, and uh, he is uh, uh, helping uh, stop the coronavirus vaccine uh, virus spreading around the world. And uh, 
coincidentally, I would like to mention that uh, he's a proud immigrant like myself from Beirut, Lebanon. And uh, it's uh, in interesting to mention that uh, both of us went to the same high school in uh, Beirut called the Armenian Evangelical High School. Wow, that is a tremendous story. I didn't even know that personal connection. That's amazing. So on that note, thank you so much to all the amazing panelists. I want to turn over our program uh, back to Dylan for our final segment, which has to do with education. Let me unmute myself. Sorry, guys. <laughs> thank you, uh, Mr. Consul, and, and thank you, uh, Roxanne. Um, that was an amazing segment. Um, so, so grateful uh, for you to share your stories and your perspectives, and we look forward to working with you in this upcoming legislative session. All right. Thanks, guys. All right. So now let's go ahead and bring in Jolie and uh, Stephanie. Let me unmute you guys. All right. And Julie, I think you are, you are, there you go. All right, so um, so what do you guys think? First of all, good good uh, program, huh? Fantastic program. And in fact, like many parents, I am home, you know, my kids are home going, working, doing school from home. So I'm also a, a teacher. So I pulled them in um, over the past hour to be part of this panel so that they could also learn. So thank you. Yeah. Great, great. Well, good. I'm, I'm glad uh, we could all do this together. And, um, you know, I know our four organizations are working together uh, to try to get uh, Holocaust and Armenian genocide and genocide education um, passed here in the state of Nevada. Um, we th There are, what, 18 states, I think, that have Holocaust education now. And um, hopefully we'll, yeah, we'll, it will make uh, Nevada the 19th. Um, Jolie, um, you, you've done, um, I, I think, a good job, and through ADL have, have done a good job of trying to make sure that Holocaust education is accurate. Um, we just, the accuracy has been a, a big, um, and if I'm putting you on the spot, I, so, <laughs> I don't want to put you on the spot, but, um, but if you can um, uh, talk a little bit about, um, you know, accuracy and how important accuracy is in, in the classroom, especially nowadays when we see that hate crimes are on the rise and um, Holocaust denial is on the rise. Yeah. So, you know, what we've seen uh, specifically in the state of Nevada is that there's really um, no framework in how the Holocaust is taught. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have seen the Holocaust be taught from a point of view where um, humanizing Hitler and talking about what a nice boy he was until his dad beat him. Right. Right. Um, to giving accurate information. And so what I think all of our organizations are really trying to do is to give teachers more resources. There are groups um, in Nevada through the Holocaust Governors Council, through um, the survivors groups that work with teachers to try to get them, give them more education, to give them more tools in their toolkit on how to teach the Holocaust. Um, and we're hoping by working together to put legislation that we will be able to amplify that and give additional resources and to have the Department of Education work with us to push that down to each and every t teacher within the state. That's, that's fantastic. And and then um, Stephanie, and again, I, I don't mean to put anybody on this, but we're just having a conversation. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to, to uh, check in with you. Um, how is it going in terms of engaging, and, and Jolie, feel free to respond as well. Um, how is it going engaging the local um, community as it relates to Holocaust education? I know there's a very robust um, community of Holocaust educators in Nevada, and especially in Clark County. Um, what is what is their impression in terms of, and what is their perspective on getting this um, kind of legislation passed in Nevada? Yeah, well, I think what Jolie mentioned is um, is spot on. It's that we're not negating what's already happening in our community, right? The people who have been focusing on Holocaust education throughout the state of Nevada. But I think that there's no doubt um, among the, the several organizations in our community that we can and should be doing so much more. And so the real work is just beginning. Um, and if if we weren't in yesterday, it's it's critical that we're there today so that we don't miss it for tomorrow. Um, and and 
And I think that, you know, what Jolie said about making sure that our educators are educated uh, to teach the Holocaust is, is critical, right? Like you can mandate education all day long, but we need to make sure that our educators are educated and how to teach Holocaust and Armenian genocide um, education in, in the classroom. It's, it's crucial. Excellent. Excellent. Um, uh, Lena, uh, can you talk a little bit about, I mean, for you, um, and thank you for coming back on, uh, for you, your, there you go. Are you there? Can you, can you, can you uh, let's see, you have a mic issue. Are you there? Yes, I'm okay. here. All right. uh, uh, so yes, I, I, it is very personal to me, obviously, because as a descendant of genocide survivors, but even more so, uh, I want to say that my kids, Rafi and Athena Hovanesian, uh, really, um, were the ones who were interested to spearhead this in the sense that they, uh, you know, we are, uh, our community just re was re-traumatized. They know our history and they've been told in an age appropriate way. They are now teenagers and they have now witnessed through social media, the impact of the war on, on Armenians in Artsakh. And unfortunately, through social media, they have seen a lot of the torture and the torment that has happened to the POWs and civilians. Unfortunately, Azeri soldiers have put that on social media. So, you know, this is something that our kids are impacted by social media. But on a more appropriate way, I think that in high school, now they're 15 and 16, they feel that it's very important. And they realize that so many of their peers while they're very well-meaning, don't really know the history or understand the pain and trauma of having a family that's been through genocide or a culture now that's being impacted again uh, by the same perpetrators. So I have to say that the impetus for genocide education is very timely and it really comes from having teenagers who are ready to, uh, mentally ready to understand this type of message and history. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. And, and just to kind of go off of that, I mean, we know that by teaching the Holocaust and genocide that we are creating empathy that people are going to understand when they see this happening, they're going to have the power and the ideas on how to speak up on the importance of being an ally of not being quiet. And so I think that is another reason that teaching about the Holocaust and other genocides is so important. So we're empowering our students for future generations. Absolutely. And I think, you know, we see um, a, a very clear um, spike in hate crime targeting uh, targeting Jewish individuals um, or people associated with Jewish individuals. So, I mean, I think that uh, and, and there was a great, by the way, there was a great um, a survey that came out by the USC Shoah Foundation uh, showing that those students who do have Holocaust education, like you just said, Jolie, um, they're more uh, empathetic and, and will stand up against bullies and, and that kind of thing. And, and if we need anything now, um, <laughs> we definitely need that now. Um, so, so look, I think that um, uh, it'll be exciting for all of us to work together uh, for the upcoming session. I'm, I'm very much looking forward to it. And um, I think we have great bipartisan support, um, a lot of energy and, and excitement um, about this upcoming bill. And I know it, as the Congresswoman said earlier, we'll, we'll be doing it virtually uh, for the most part, I guess. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. But um, I just personally wanted to say thank you uh, to you guys, to ADL, um, Jewish Nevada and uh, ANCA for, um, for your, your collaboration and partnership for this uh, important bill. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks for including us. This is yeah. uh, important and critical to our work and to our mission. So we appreciate Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yes, Dylan, thank you again. And, you know, on just, just a last note, you. is that we know that um, that the Holocaust and genocide don't just start with actions. They start with words. And Absolutely. So we need to be teaching um, not just our students, but each other. And we need to have these conversations around our kitchen table. So uh, my action actionable item for this is tonight when people are sitting um, at their table, having dinner, have a conversation about this panel, do some research um, and and really try to embrace this in your in your conversation this evening. Absolutely. And, and stay tuned because we will have uh, more information about the legislative effort, uh, hopefully later this week or, or early next. And we'll have a lot more calls to action <laughs> for coming from all of this. Sorry, on Go ahead, a Lana. starting note too, uh, Athena had a special message to the panel. I was wondering if you could also play it for our audience. My 15-year-old uh, had a personal note too because she knew this was happening today. And she really wanted to make a brief statement about her, the impact of the genocide on her and her thoughts. 
You, you know what I'll have to do, um, Lena, because um, our our friends in Congress, some of them just sent me their videos a little bit ago, <laughs> so I had to I had to queue those up. So I don't have I don't have Athena's, but what I'll do is I'll upload it to um, the channels, and we and people can see it um, through the video recording that's available after this. If that's okay. Okay. Sounds perfect. good. Perfect, perfect, perfect. All right, guys. So um, thank you. And, I, and, I, and Stephanie and Julie, I, I hope that you'll um, take advantage of, of Grant and Sylvia. I mean, they're available to you. Um, please use them in the community. Um, I think their story is amazing. And Sylvia's book, The Nazi's Granddaughter, comes out March 9th. Um, so if you want to look out for that, we posted the link uh, in the chat. Great. All right. So thank you guys again so much for, for, for hanging in there, first of all, through a long program and uh, also for co-sponsoring with us um, this, this afternoon. And uh, it, hopefully it's the um, just the beginning of more collaborations and cooperation to come. Yes. All thank right. you. Thanks, Looking guys. forward to it. Thank Thanks, you. Bye-bye. Thank you.